Okay, we're going to pick up in Romans 3 tonight. Pastor Jerry did the last two weeks in Romans 1 and 2. And of course, the story goes on in 3 as Paul continues to uh, deal with working with both Jews and Gentiles, trying to get them to understand what this is all about, this new relationship with Jesus. And it gets, Paul becomes very radical in Romans 3. He introduces some things that are a challenge even to us Gentiles when we really stop and think about it. So uh, I love this chapter. So we're going to pick up uh, in verse 1, where it says, What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. But what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For, how, for then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. Okay, he's just gotten done in two talking about, you know, circumcision means nothing. <laughs> It's what's in the heart, not what you do externally. And so here he raises a question in chapter 3 where he says, so what advantage is there to being a Jew? Is there an advantage to being a Jew is really the question he's asking here. Because um, he's gone through this whole thing that circumcision and the law cannot save. It cannot save you, so therefore all that the Jews have been doing is not able to save them. Um, so is there an advantage to being God's chosen nation, if that's what you want to use as a term? Is there any advantage to it? Um, you know, because in Romans 2.11, he even says there, there is no partiality with God. That to God, there is no Jew or Gentile. It's just people. It's all the same. So uh, what good is it to be Jewish? But right after he says that in verse 2, he says what? Much in every way. Mm -hmm. There is an advantage to it. And really because... He talks here about the fact that he explains that they were entrusted with what he calls the oracles of God here. Really what it was is they were entrusted with the word of God. They were the ones that was given through to the world, and they brought it down to us. The whole Old Testament would not exist if it were not for the Jews. We wouldn't know any of that. And it was all part of the plan. It was all part of the system. And they were given the privilege of being to be able to communicate that to us today. Now he goes on later on in Romans 9, 4 and explains there's even other advantages. They have the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, they have the promises. All those things were given to them. Were given specifically to the Jews first. So there's lots of advantages that have been given to them. Um, so it is, but he goes in here also to say, but what if some did not believe? And the reality is, the majority of Jews, even in the Old Testament, probably did not believe the way they were supposed to. They followed the rules, they followed the laws. But a lot of them, you know, we know that because God had to keep sending prophets to them to tell them to get their lives back on track, to get it straight again, because they were not following God the way they were supposed to. But the fact that the Jewish people as a whole, at that point, rejected the gospel at Paul's time and rejected a lot of the old covenant did not mean that God's faithfulness to them was in vain. It showed us who our God is. That he remained faithful to his people even when they did, didn't remain faithful to him. I always thought one of the, if you want to read one of the great prophets is Hosea. He had probably the toughest job of any prophet is he was to go out and marry a prostitute. And then she went back to work. And God told him, go out and get her again. Bring her back. <laughs> and he was using through him, showing them, this is what I have done with Israel for centuries. <laughs> Every time they go out and prostitute themselves with other gods, I kept going out and bringing them back. God remained faithful to them. And now we know that, that God is faithful. 
If you know nothing, you don't learn anything else from the Old Testament, you'll learn that God was a faithful God to his word, to his promises. He stays true. He doesn't change. Um, so if some did not believe, it doesn't reduce what God did in any way. It just shows humans and people for what they are. That we, uh, we struggle with a lot of things. Um, you know, even today, you look at it, a lot of people struggle with the gospel today. Even in churches. They're moving away from the Bible, not teaching the Bible. Well, where are they getting their stories of God from? Where are they getting the understanding of who God is from? It now becomes what I think. Or what I think he should be. Or, you know... <coughs> And we miss a lot of what and who God is. But just because churches are, some churches do that, and a lot of churches don't, but some do, it doesn't reduce who God is. It doesn't change who his faithfulness. It doesn't change what he did for us. And we're going to see that as we go on. Um, that, you know, no matter what we do, God is still who he is. We don't change him in any way, shape, or form. The only one who can change in this process is us. We either can change for the better or the worse. <laughs> it's really our choice in the matter here. Um, we just have to go on believing, trusting God, proving Him in our lives, and showing the world that who He is by what He does in our lives. Um, he goes on here and says, Certainly not, indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. Paul's reminding us that God will be justified by all His actions. What God does is the right thing to be done. In the end, it will be demonstrated that even our unrighteousness somehow will show God's righteousness to the world. <laughs> even when we mess up, people can see who God is in us. <laughs> by the way, we respond to it. By the way, we get restored. By the way, God comes back to us and offers his salvation and forgiveness constantly to us. Um, or we'll all we get to see who he is by his judgment at the end if we reject <laughs> The salvation part of it. Um, Spurgeon said this. He said, let God be true and every man a liar. It is a strange, strong expression. But it's not too, none too strong. If God says one thing and every man in the world says another, God is true and all men are false. God speaks the truth and cannot lie. God cannot change. His word, like himself, is immutable. We are to believe God's truth if nobody else believes it. The general consensus of opinion is nothing to a Christian. He believes God's word, and he thinks more of that than of the universal opinion of men. And how long ago was Spurgeon? <laughs> you know, we're looking last century. And it is so applicable today that no matter what men's opinion of who God is, what does God's word say he is? And that's where we stand. We stand on that. In the end, God's the one who is truth. Men are the liars. And that's the final thing. And if, even though it looks like you might be swimming against the opinions of the world and everybody else, that's okay. Stay strong. Stay firm in his word. He goes on to say, but if our righteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. He adds that in there. He's giving a, what he is saying here is it's not that this is not inspired when he says I speak as a man. He's using a human argument, which is still used today and by some. <laughs> well, the more I sin, then the better God looks. His righteousness looks better if I just am more unrighteous. So it gives me freedom to sin. Wow. Paul brings this counter argument of an opponent here into this. Question, and he says, if my unrighteousness will demonstrate God's righteousness, then how can God judge me? What right does he have to judge me? I'm making him look better. <laughs> so, and uh, my sin ultimately serves to bring him more glory. And isn't that good? That is the argument that he produces here. So, is God unjust who inflicts wrath? So if God comes down and punishes me for that, is he not unjust? Um, Paul was very familiar with this line of thinking that says, God is in control of everything. Um, even my evil will ultimately demonstrate his righteousness. Um, how can God judge me? 
Therefore, God is unjust if he inflicts his wrath on me because I'm just a pawn in his hand. I have no control over anything. I knew a guy once who went to a church that was um, a very hyper-charismatic <laughs> church. And he was a youth pastor there. And his life was a mess. Total mess. But if you talk to him, all he would say is, Hey, I'm saved. I got saved. I'm born again. I can, I can do whatever I want. And you sit there going, I think you're missing something here. <laughs> There's some little piece here has not quite clicked with you. <laughs> Because, you know, first of all, I would never let my children be in your youth group. <laughs> I don't trust you in what you're doing. But, you know, he just had that thing that, hey, my sin produces more righteousness from God. So, I'm going to sin all I want, and you can't stop me. Because once I'm saved, I'm always saved. So, um, I'm not sure... I got to go more along the line with John Calvin who said, you know, the life should respond to change. If it does not, they probably were not saved to start with. <laughs> he never said those other things. Those are the, those who have made Calvinism since then. I think John Calvin would be a little upset over what became known as Calvinism. Because <laughs> he simply said, there ought to be a life change that comes with it. If there isn't, eh, question whether they ever really found the Lord. <laughs> you know? So the in theory, the most dramatic example of someone who might ask this question would be Judas Iscariot. When you think about it, you can hear Judas make this case. Lord, I know that I betrayed Jesus, but you used it for good. In fact, if I hadn't did what I did, Jesus would not have gone to the cross at all. And um, what I did even fulfilled the scriptures. How can you judge me at all? You see where the argument goes? It is logical. Totally wrong, but <laughs> it is logical. The answer to Judas, I think, though, from God would be something like this. Yes, God used your wickedness, but it was still your wickedness. Right. There was no good or pure motive in your heart <laughs> at all. It is no credit to you that God brought good out of evil. You stand guilty before God. And that's just it. God can bring good out of our evil. God can bring good out of disasters. He's able to turn anything around. But it doesn't negate the fact that you still did evil. <laughs> you still did the wrong thing. Um, and like I said, when he says here, I speak as a man, he's simply, simply saying, I'm, this is how a man would argue this. This is how a simple man would argue this whole thing, that it's okay to, to be this way. Well, he goes on, his response to the, that argument in the next verse is certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil, that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. So again, immediately Paul says, he just dismisses the whole question. There's no way, you know, certainly not. This is not an argument that you can make with God. It's not going to work. Um, if things were such as his opponent suggested, then God can't judge anybody. That means judge can't, God, God cannot judge what he created. He has no power. He would cancel it out. He cancels, it, he cancels himself out of the <laughs> equation, which is... Which is the whole thing, you know, my argument I've always had with creationism versus evolution. Why would God create a system that does not need him? Because evolution is designed to operate on its own. It doesn't need a God. So God created a system that eliminates himself from the equation. I can't see God ever doing that. <laughs> he doesn't completely, he never pulls himself out. He's always been here. He's always been involved with his creation, with his work, with his people. Um, he's still around at all times. So how will God judge the world? Both Paul and his readers, it was given that the judgment day was coming. They believed in a judgment day. Um, and some would be acquitted and some condemned. I mean, the Jews believed that. They thought it was. He didn't need that. He wasn't going to talk about that point at this period of time. It was just understood in the Jewish culture at that time that there would be a judgment day that's coming for everyone. Now, Paul understood that God would judge the world, both Jews and Gentiles. Many of the Jews of Paul's days believed that God would come and judge the Gentiles for his sin, 
but saved the Jews despite his sin. That's how they were thinking. God will be the judge, and he will judge the Gentiles, but as Jews, he'll let us get through because we're his people. <laughs> so, and, of course, that's not true. And that's part of where Paul's argument is headed here. Because he talks about, for if the truth of God is increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? He reestates the objection of the arguer, you know, saying that we can go ahead and sin. Let us do evil that good may come. Now this was a perversion of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. Um, it's interesting that, you know, as it talks about here, some have slanderously reported that we are teaching. They took his message of grace and justification and propitiation and turned it, they reported in what he is saying, is, it's okay to just go sin, do whatever you want. And it was reported that that was what Paul was teaching. And you're going to see here in a moment, it was probably started by the Jews, because he says some things in here that are really contrary to everything they believe. And it shook the world. It shook the whole world up, both Jews and Gentiles. Um, because this accusation, when he's preaching forgiveness and salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, not works, that is just, that's a radical concept. And it's interesting because, you know, Pastor Jerry mentioned this, that, you know, there's been times he's been accused of, you know, not teaching enough about sin and judgment. You know, it's too much about love and grace. And that. But that's the message, <laughs> is love and grace. It's, it's what it's all about. Paul got accused of that. So, um, so you mean anybody can just sin and do whatever they want? You know, no, there needs to be judgment. There needs to be, well, there will be, but that's not our job. That will come in its own time. That's not what the church is to do. That's not our role. So it's really interesting that, you know, when I think about that, whenever he makes that statement, I always sit there thinking, you're a good company, Pastor Jerry. Blame Paul, too. He <laughs> said Paul was teaching the same thing. Too much love and grace, not enough judgment. You know, it's just, of course, that's what Jesus taught <laughs> when he was here, was love and grace. And, uh, I mean, he could have brought judgment while he was here, but he chose not to. He decided to hold off and give us all a chance, which I'm grateful he did. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks about, at the very end, he says, their condemnation is just. Paul will not even answer such an absurd twisting of the gospel. You know, I'm not even going to defend. I'm slanderously reported as saying all this. I'm not even going to defend it. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get accused of things, you just got to go, I, whatever. <laughs> Walk away, because if people believe I said that, then they don't know me. And then it doesn't really matter anyway. I'll never convince them any other way. Uh, unfortunately, in our world today, we've gotten too quick to judge people and... Uh, not even know who they are or what they were really trying to say or meaning to say, and then you get a media report on what they said, which is always slanted, one way or another. Just because that's the way we are as people, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter if you slanted right, left, center, upside down, doesn't matter. Do you know that person? Have you ever really sat and talked with that person and found out what's really in their heart? Because some people mean good things and say really stupid things, trying to make those good things happen. And, you know, don't think everything. Don't, oh, you know, and that's why you're supposed to be able to sit down and have a debate and talk about it. And come up with solutions. And today it's all about defending a position rather than finding a solution. And which is why I stay out of it for the most part now because it's, God knows. Are you talking about apologetics? No, I'm talking about in the world with politics and what's oh, the right okay. thing to do with this or that. You know, nothing's perfect. None of our solutions are perfect. They all carry a problem with them. You just got to look for the one that creates the least problems, usually. But you can't even have those dialogues anymore because everyone gets angry and mad and upset if you don't agree with them. So I was like, all right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Jesus. <laughs> don't worry about that stuff. Because <laughs> he's the one who's going to get us there eventually. Twisting the glorious free gift of God in Jesus is a supposed license to sin, is what they're saying he's teaching. You know what, this is simply a twisting of man's depravity, that he can actually take that message and turn it into that. Because that's what he wants it to be. <laughs> the ability to sin all I want, and still be okay with God. Um, it's, it's perverting and mocking what God did. 
really, that whole concept and idea. Um, this twisting is so sinful that Paul saves it for last because it's beyond the depravity of the pagans, which was in Roman 1, 24 and 32, he talked about the depravity of the pagans. It's beyond the hypocrisy of the moralists from Romans 2, 1 to 5. And beyond the false confidence of the Jews of Romans 2, 17 to 29. Now in 3, he brings up, these people are twisting it to such a depraved level. They're saying we can do whatever we want. Just go sin all you want. It's okay. And you'll get there. So you can see the levels. He's taking this right along this argument, continues right on dealing with all the people of his day. You know, pagans, the Gentile world, the moralists, the good people, the Jews. And now he's dealing with those who are just very depraved and twist everything that God says and does. Anything in there that strikes you? Anything? Reminds you of anything? Yeah. When we first moved down here in 97, that was the first time I ever encountered them, that particular mentality. And it seems to be amongst the native Tennesseans here. And I don't know how strong of a vein it is, but gee, I couldn't believe it. You know, so we, we went to the store and we went to a funeral uh, for the wife of our neighbor. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and there was these guys talking about waiting for somebody so they could beat him up when, they, when he came into the church. And I mean, these are the kind of guys that I... The, that, I mean, the stuff they were talking about was rough stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, like being out in a bar on Friday night, getting into a bar fight and splitting somebody's guts wide open with a broken beer bottle. And somehow, the subject of the Lord, of the Lord came up. <coughs> we were standing there, and, and, and uh, I was talking to one of them. He says, I, I, I'm washed in the blood. <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's like they're not even curious. Like they, they, they don't want to really know any more than that. Because mm -hmm. if they know any more, then they're responsible for, for knowing more. Yeah. But it was really weird to me. To, yeah. to and I think to a degree, there's a lot of people, we do it, some, some people do it very subtly in their own lives. We excuse ourselves for certain things, knowing that we all kind of forgive us. And we know that it's not quite the right thing to do. <laughs> but God will forgive us. <laughs> and you know, we justify it. That's no better than the one who's blatant with it, who just, you know, lives in the world, but, you know, washing the blood. You know, we, we do that subtly sometimes. So, it's like they're kind of inoculated against. Yeah. We have to be really careful that we don't do it in a subtle way in our own lives sometimes and just overlook something. I always hated in church when I talked about sins of all nations. I hated that that mm -hmm. class of sins because it's easy to overlook something <laughs> and just say, "Ah, it's not going to get wrong," you know, when it really is wrong. And somebody probably should stand up and say something, and it probably won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Romans nine. What then? Are we better than they? Now he's going on and contrasting them to the true believers here. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. He starts out here, what then are we better than they? All Jews, all Gentiles, 
everyone he includes in this list of statements here. Now, Paul by birth is Jewish, and that is his heritage. When he says we, he's talking about him and the Jews. Are we better than everyone else because we've come out of this heritage? Um, and he points out that by nature, the Jewish person is no more right with God than the pagan or the moralist. Wow. Um, in fact, he demonstrates that the pagan, the moralist, and the Jews are all under sin and all under condemnation. We're all in the same place. This term here, under sin, is a powerful phrase in the Greek. Um, it speaks of slavery to sin. Uh, it literally means sold under sin. So, and this is where we get the term of we are slaves to sin. Without Jesus, you cannot not sin. And that's where we have to be understanding as people that if someone doesn't know the Lord, they have no power. They are a slave to sin. They have no choice but to sin. Because it enslaved them. We as believers have a choice to not sin. That's the only difference between a believer and a, an unbeliever cannot help himself but sin. The believer now has the ability to make a choice and with the power of the Holy Spirit helping them can make the right choice. We still sometimes make the wrong choice. And that's why we don't get judgmental on the other side because we mess up too. But we do have the power to not sin if we will exercise it. And, uh, and as it says in the New Testament that if we'll resist to the point of shedding blood, then we've done our job. But most of us give in long before that point. <laughs> and, uh, and so the... He goes in here to talk about there is no one righteous. If you read this, these statements in here, there is none righteous. No, not one. That is a quote out of about six or seven different Psalms. Nothing new. This comes out of the Old Testament. Psalms 14, uh, Psalms 5, Psalm 140, Psalm 10, Psalm 36. comes out of Isaiah 59. Uh, nobody is righteous. No, not one human being. Nowhere. Doesn't happen. Never happened, never will happen, outside of Jesus. <laughs> so, it just doesn't happen. He's clear throughout here. No one, no one seeks after God. Altogether, they're unprofitable. And he goes through the whole body. Their throat is an open tomb. Talks about their throat, their tongue, their lips, their mouth, their teeth, their eyes. They're all sinful. <laughs> everything is. <laughs> he includes everything here so that everybody gets the point. Everybody, everything, everything about us without God is sinful. There's just nothing good in there. Um, and the reasoning being there is no fear of God before their eyes. They don't understand who God is. And they don't fear Him. That's really the summarizing he does here. Is that every sin of rebellion against God happens because we don't have a proper understanding, respect, fear of God. Now we always like to translate that word fear, you know, respect, reverential respect for God. But the word that's used both the old and the Hebrew and the new Greek is the word that means terror and dread. <laughs> it's understanding who this God is, and if you stand in his presence without the blood of Jesus, you don't exist. <laughs> you will be vaporized into non-existence or something will happen because this is a pure holy God. <laughs> Every single prophet who saw him and came into an encounter fell on his face. Woe is me. I'm done for. I'm going to die. That's what I know that's what's going through their head. Is I'm dead. I'm now dead because I'm in God's presence. You know, they had a fear of God and it was not reverential respect. It was plain, I'm scared of this holy being. But I also know he's God. <laughs> and I also see that he's unlimited. And, and it is always God who approaches the prophet. He says, pick him up. <laughs> take a coal. Cleanse his lips. <laughs> you know, get it? Well, I'll take care of that part for you. I need you. I'm, I've given you this privilege because I need you. And I want to use you. And that's the way it is for us as believers as well. He uses us. And he allows us to have through the blood of Christ now an open door in his presence and it's just, I'm reading it, listening today again as I'm on my way in I put, put on my phone, I put on the scripture just reading, you know 
and this, you know, inviting us into his presence, into the throne of God, into the throne of grace, to come in, to be able to meet with God, and to talk with him. What a privilege with this awesome holy God that we really shouldn't be standing in his presence. And he said, nah, come on in. Come on in and talk with me. So now let's have a talk. Yeah, and, and, and like uh, in the New Testament, Jesus will refer to people with such close names like damsel and daughter. He, yeah. When he's, you know, healing people, it's just, it's, yeah. you know, it's such a personal and loving sort of situation. You know, it, this is from the fearful creator, you know, yeah. in the universe. So. It's a balance yeah. in our lives. We need to fear who God is, but also understand that through Christ, we're also not his child. Adopted in, fully accepted by him, loved by him, and in fact, co heir with his son Jesus. I, have to, I get to that point, I have to kind of stop because I don't get it. I don't get how we get to that point. <laughs> it's like, there's no way I can even, I don't even want to be mentioned as a co heir with Jesus. I can't be on that level. Well, I can. But he can invite me there. <laughs> he can bring me there. And this is what we're going to see he goes into here. Um, no, he goes into, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be, become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul here is pointing out this, this, this horrific description of man's utter sinfulness comes to us in the law. It is intended for those under the law to silence every critic Every demonstration, every, you know, the universal guilt of mankind. All the world is guilty before God. And he shows it by gift. When he gave us the law, it showed us we're all guilty. None of us can keep it. None of us can do it right. None of us get it straight. So he has shown it to all of us. To those who are under the law, God speaks his ways to those who had the law and attempted to do it through the law. I mean, the Jews attempted to do it. They tried. It didn't take long before it didn't look anything like what God Moses gave them because they just couldn't do it, so they had to keep modifying it and finding loopholes and figuring out a way we can do it. <laughs> and they ended up doing something that had nothing by the time Jesus came along. You know, all of Jesus' criticisms with the Pharisees and it had nothing to do with the law. It had all to do with the traditions they added to the law. These are still, the law was still perfect. It was still good. It was all the stuff that man added on. And I sometimes look in the, ch in the church too, and again, I'm not anti-church. I love church. I love the church. We need the church. <laughs> With all of its faults and flaws, we need it. Um, but, you know, I sometimes look at all these rules and regulations we've created in the church that God never put on us. <laughs> we put burdens on people just like the Pharisees did that we can't we aren't able to keep some things, and yet we're expecting everyone else to keep them, you know? I, I was in a church once that had a set of rules that were for, if you join this church, you agree to follow these rules. We're telling you they're not biblical. They're not anti-biblical, you know, they think, but this is a standard we want for people who come to our church, who are members. Now, you can attend here and just don't become a member. But if you join, you will give 10% of your income, you will do this, you will do this, and, at certain things, I think it was no drinking, no dancing, whatever, you know. I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> I had to sit there and think about that and decide, well, that is not, no, most of that's not in the Bible, <laughs> as a law or legalism. So I, you know, yeah, I'll just keep it that way. <laughs> I'm not going to agree to it. Not that I was doing any of it. I wasn't. I believed in the, you know, in the giving. I believed in, you know, at that point, I was raised in a family where we weren't supposed to do that. That went away. So <laughs> my daughter became a ballerina. So, you know, it was <laughs> like, you know, <coughs> you know, I got out of that world in a hurry. Got into, you know. You know, it's just we, we create this set of false righteousness. Mm -hmm. We feel good about ourselves if we keep a few rules. And uh, again, I'm going to keep moving here because this is just so great where but he goes. Don't you think, this. Bill, it's to maintain uh, a order or civilization as a more means of re you know, Control. being civilized with each other? It is, but how it's is my not dancing keep things civilized? That doesn't do anything. 
<laughs> <laughs> Whether I give ten percent or nine percent right. to the church, right. how does that keep? <laughs> yeah. But if you're well, it helps yeah. support the church. It helps support okay. the church. It helps support the church and the missions and stuff like but that. But New Testament giving is it's all his. Right. Give as the oh, Lord true. leads you. Give liberally. Right. Yeah. Give with a cheerful heart. That's the New Testament. <laughs> Everyone close to ten percent. You know that's the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know the New Testament is it's all God's. Every, once you give yourself to the Lord, it's all His. Everything you have is His, and you give as He directs you to give. Mm -hmm. Some people may give two percent, and some may give eighty percent. Mm -hmm. I've known some who have, mm -hmm. and God blesses those, you know, whatever way He does it. There's not a formula. Mm -hmm. It's got, but the key is, God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. And when you're having to get out your calculator and figure out how much I owe this week. That's usually not a cheerful giver. <laughs> it's like, oh man, we're going to be close <laughs> at the end of the month. <laughs> you know? But you got to do that. Creates stress, <laughs> creates worry, you know. And it's like, I'm glad you to give it to the Lord, though. I am you glad to give it. it. You know. And again, that's okay. If that works for you, that's wonderful. And, um, but let's, let's look at where Paul goes with this, because um, so you got to remember that every... The Jewish people of Paul's day took every passage out of the Old Testament describing evil and applied it only to the Gentiles. That's like the, uh, <laughs> and we do that sometimes in the church. We apply it, this is the world. You know, this is what will happen to the world. To the world, you know, we apply it outside the door. And I'm trying to understand, though. If the law was given to them, why would they apply it to somebody else? Well, the, only the evil part. And when it talks about evil, that's them, because we're not evil. We're his people. Oh, that's what they thought. That's what they thought. <laughs> we can't be evil that's because sort of we're crazy, his people. That's sort of crazy um, thing. You know, so you have to be careful that sometimes we, we even do do that. We apply things outside the church that, you know, that one of the, the, the great phrases we use, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man will hear my voice. And I'll show him the door and I'll come in and sup with him. You know who that's written to? Church. The church. Yeah. That is not written to the world. Jesus is saying, would you let me in the church? <laughs> I'm standing at the door knocking. Would you open the door? I'll come in and be with you. <laughs> he had to ask the church to open the door to him. Mm. You know, and you go back and read that in Revelation. It is in one of the letters to the churches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me in. <laughs> would you let me in the church? You know, that's that's what tells me we have Sometimes push Jesus out the door. <laughs> and I always have thought, you know, I don't know if you heard about the pastor who, who uh, was a new pastor at a church, and the first Sunday he went there, he dressed up as a homeless man. You guys hear about that? Yeah. I heard about that. You know, he dressed up as a homeless man, he was all oh, smelly clothes, everything else came mm -hmm. in. And, you know, of course, people in the church were like, oh, what's he doing in there? You know, and, blah, 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 and keep him in the back out of the way, and, you know, and hope nobody sees him, and all this kind of. Here was the new pastor. He just wanted to see the response. Mm -hmm. If a homeless man walks in here, how is this church going to react? You know, and they were shutting him, basically. They wanted him out of here because he's going to make us look like a not a good church. You know? Mm -hmm. A church full of homeless is a good church. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. doing its job of reaching out to the lost. And, uh, you know, we have to be careful. He goes on here and says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. The law cannot save us. The law can't justify us. Mm -hmm. It is only useful for giving us the knowledge of sin. That's all it does for us. It doesn't save us. It just tells us what sin is. Um, you know, and since Adam and Eve, people have tried to justify themselves by the deeds of the law. When Adam sinned, what's the first thing he did? He blamed it. And when God came down, what did he do? He covered himself up with fig leaves. Found a way to justify it and cover himself up. Maybe God won't see it. <laughs> you know, trying to justify himself using it. Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, says in Job 9 too, how can a man be righteous before God? You know, Job knew it. <laughs> you cannot be righteous before God. It just can't happen. Um, so Paul makes it clear here. Nobody is. 
Not one person. No, 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 no. If you read that, go through that, read that again. Count how many times it says there's none. No one. None. No one. None. <laughs> no one. Nobody. And nobody can argue they're righteous. It's just not there. Um, go on to Romans 21. Uh, chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. But now he starts in this section. <laughs> all this stuff he's going on, all the, you know, he's gone through the Gentile pagans, he's gone through, you know, the moralists who just aren't good enough, he's gone through the Jews who under the law have messed it all up. <laughs> And then he's gone through the depraved people who even want to sin and call it good for God. <laughs> and now he goes, but now, the righteousness of God. And here, in this little section, he makes such a radical change in what the Jews believed and what any Gentile ever understood, that this changes everything for all of us. This is the, probably the most glorious transition from judgment of Romans 3.20 to justification of Romans 3.21. He ends with the law, tells us about what sin is, all it does. However, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Um, God, the law cannot save us, but God reveals a righteousness that will save us apart from the law. It's outside the law. <laughs> it it's, doesn't rely upon the law to save us totally outside of it. It is the essence of God's plan of salvation in Jesus. It is salvation that is offered apart from the law, apart from our own earning and deserving. Apart from our own merits. Because nothing we do is good enough. So this takes it completely outside of that realm. This is apart from the law, which the law is about doing. It's about following the rules and regulations and being right. This says, now, now you will get it apart from the law, without it. And it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. What that means here, that they're witnessing this, is that they are confirming that this is God's plan from day one, was to get to this point. This is not a new idea. This righteousness was not a novelty that Paul came up with. The prophets, the law and the prophets predicted it a long time ago that this was coming this day they just didn't understand it um, the old testament said that righteousness was coming <clears throat> they tied it all into this messiah was going to come and bring righteousness on the earth they didn't understand that the messiah was going to come and bring righteousness into the hearts of men and women <clears throat> but it wasn't going to be a change on the earth right away in people and separate us out from this world but leave us here to live for a while <laughs> you know so we are now in the world but no longer of the world and that's a hard place to live obviously we all struggle apart from the law it isn't that the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the Old Testament but it is revealed apart from the principles of the law it is apart from the legal relationship with God. The law was a legal relationship. You do this, this, and this, and you are okay. God said they would be. Do your sacrifice. You know, do one in the morning, do one in the evening. <laughs> Once a year, the Day of Atonement. Went through all these rules and regulations. You do all these things. Bring in a tenth of all you have into the temple, you know, to take care of the poor. You do all that. I will say you're okay. But it was based on a legal system of do this and you're okay. Now, 
it's no longer based on the idea of earning and deserving merit. Well, I did all these things. God. I don't have to do any of that. It's not offered as something to take up the slack between our ability to keep the law and God's perfect standard. Righteousness is not that thing that kind of slides us on a scale, helps push us onto the good end of the scale. <laughs> it's not what it's about. It is completely apart from our own attempts at righteousness. This is a righteousness that is so far outside us that when it comes in us, we're just a new creature. Totally changed. Um, and he goes on to say here in verse 22 how this righteousness is communicated, man. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Paul told us how righteousness does not come. It doesn't come by the deeds of the law. It is a part of from the law. So how does the saving righteousness come? Through faith in Jesus Christ and on all, to all and on all who believe. Now, it's through faith in Jesus, not by faith in Jesus. That is a different thing here. It is not our faith. It's not because I believe that I'm righteous in Christ. I'm righteous in Christ through him. Because he's already done it all for me. I don't have to do anything. So it's not my faith. Again, not even my faith gets me there. It's my faith through his, through faith in him. It's through Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything here points to what Jesus did. And this is why we say we must always keep Jesus centered, the centrality of the church. He is the main thing. Well, wouldn't there be a huge problem the minute that someone could get in by the law? Because that would negate him going to the cross. Anything we do that earns anything doesn't negate what Jesus did. But it, we can't do it. That's the right. whole point. That's what Paul has just spent two chapters explaining is you can't do anything right. You can't do one single thing right. But you know what? Through him, apart from the law, take the law, throw it out. Because it's about faith through G, through faith in Jesus Christ, Him alone. That is the only way we can get to salvation. Well, isn't it that when Christ came, when Jesus came, <coughs> all the stuff they were doing in the law, Christ fulfilled all that. Yeah. So He became the fulfillment of what was going on. Well, he lived the perfect life. Yeah. That's why He could offer Himself for us. He never broke a rule. He broke all their traditions. But he didn't break a single rule <laughs> that God laid down. That's what I like about Jesus. He was very fine breaking men's rules. <laughs> I'll shake them to their core because I don't care about their rules. And that's why he got angry at them, like I said earlier, is because you put burdens on them that God never intended to put on people. He already knew how hard it was to keep the law, and you added laws to the law. <clears throat> What is wrong with you people? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it already hard enough? You know, I, I can imagine thinking, didn't my father make this hard enough on you already that you had to make it harder? <laughs> you know, what's wrong with you? But it became a matter of control and power. Yeah. Controlling our religion. But I, I, I really struggle with, okay, and you alluded to a while ago about, um, about us living in, in a culture, in a certain culture, and we have we have some, we don't live in the same culture that they did. Mm -hmm. We don't, they were not a democratic society. Right. Uh, even in, during the times of the Jew, where the Jews ruled themselves, they were not a democratic society. Mm -hmm. And um, we are a democratic society. And so, uh, at least in name. <laughs> and so we, we, uh, we want our loved ones and those around us and ourselves to enjoy the blessings of a civil society. Mm -hmm. And a civil society is best described by maybe not all of the law, but part of the law. You know, especially the Ten Commandments. You know, don't kill your brother or sister, you know, don't envy your your brother or sister's wife or husband. Mm -hmm. And and um, so for us to try to influence our society is that wrong in that way? I mean, I, I really struggle with this. You know that I should not expect that non-believers would be able to 
fully fulfill the kind of life that Christ has given to us through his strength. Mm -hmm. You know, the spiritual strength that he's given. It's not me, but it's the spiritual strength that he's given me to be able to avoid some of the things that are a true danger, you know, to other people's lives. Drugs, I mean, uh, the scourge of drugs in our country is just horrific. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I, I struggle with that. I really well, it is a struggle because, again, I mean, like I said, we are now not of this world any longer, but we are still in the world. So we're having to bring a system that the world cannot understand, and we do it by our lives. In a second here, we're going to look at something, uh, you know, because if you look at what Paul is saying here, you can sit there and say, but James says, faith without works is dead. So is, are those two not contradicting each other? Because he's saying, you can't do anything at all. Paul says, no works at all, it's all about faith through Christ. And then James says, without works, your faith is dead. James is describing the character of a believer. Mm -hmm. Paul is describing the position of a believer. Mm -hmm. They're describing two different things. Once you are have that faith through Christ, you're then going to want, your character should lead you to want to do the right thing, to create a civil society, to create order, to create, to do, be a peacemaker, as we've heard on Sunday, to be that one who will step out. But understand this, the world will hate you because of it. They're not going to accept it. Because to them, it's you want me to live by your moral standard. You know, who are you to tell me what, you know, what's the right and wrong, you know? And so they're going to hate it, they're going to fight it, but that doesn't mean you keep, don't keep trying, <laughs> you don't keep working toward it. Um, it's interesting, because democracy is an interesting thing. It's been the last system that came on the scene, and uh, of course the only thing in scripture we have is a theocracy, where God is in charge and we do what we're supposed to do. That's the only government God ever gives us. Democracy is self-rule, it's the total opposite. I will determine what the society will look like. I will determine by my vote what it's going to be. And well, that works if the majority are all believers, or <laughs> it works really well. But once you have a majority who are not believers, guess what? They're going to change it to what they want it to be. And it's going to go their way next. What does that do for us as a believer? It doesn't change how we live one little bit. We continue to live it, we continue to teach it, we continue to show it in our own lives, we continue to reach out and help others, we continue every opportunity to fix the society, we try, we keep working at it. All I am saying is this has to be to understand that down here is not what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to accomplish the kingdom of God, which is, I just want to take people out of here with me. And as many of them will listen and go with me, great. Doesn't mean I vote. I'm gonna always vote. I have that right and that privilege. I will never not. Vote. I'm gonna go out and cast my opinion. You know, like, but I also don't know all the answers. I can't solve half these problems. I, you know, I don't know how to solve them. And so I do the best I can with that. But I make that a minor part of my life. I'm more concerned with are people seeing Jesus in me? Am I being, am I being someone whom they can look at and say, wow, that's a better way to live. You know, or am I just like everybody else, <laughs> struggling and oh, woe is me sometimes? <laughs> you know, or have I found a better way to live and show it, let it bleed over to the outside, not be you know, uh, uh, you know, someone who's putting people down for what they believe, but rather you know, lifting them up and saying, hey, how can I help you? I don't care if you don't believe the way I believe. How can I help you? Well, why do you want to help me then? I think mean, that's what Jesus would do. <laughs> he, just, he helps people. <laughs> and you know, the day will come if they don't turn to the Lord, they will face judgment. I'm just trying to see if I can get them to avoid that part. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a that's the dichotomy we're gonna always have. Like, I understand exactly what you're saying. I am torn into it. Like I'm just, you know, just ripped up going, Lord, why can't we fix this down here? <laughs> what you know, and then I read this and realize because you can't fix it. Yeah, you know, I think there's, I think the Lord has put pieces even in the sinner's heart. They know, yeah. and the Bible says they see things, they see the world. They have that essence because if you get take the same drug dealer that's uh, selling whatever, and he starts counting his money, and it's off by a little bit, 
Well, then they're good, you know. He says, oh, you don't need to have morals. I'll sell drugs to the kids. There's no more real moral. Don't bother me with these assholes. I want these laws. If his money's off by a little bit, guess who now wants to be exact about his, his law and his total and what he thinks yeah. about, you know, for, you know sure. whether it should sure. be right or wrong. You know, if it's wrong, he knows it. So there's, you know, there's, he puts it in our hearts to know these things, even if we're sinners, you know. The faith that he's talking about here is not trusting or expecting God to do something, but relying on the testimony concerning who Christ, his son, is. We just believe that. The work of Christ on the cross. It's not that I hope Jesus will save me. It is he has saved me by his death on the cross. I haven't saved me. That is a past tense thing for me. And through faith in him, it will become a reality one day. I will see him. It's already a reality. I know it. Through the Holy Spirit that lives in me. But it is. I, it's not a thing that I'm, I'm, I'm trusting it's going to happen. Which sometimes when we say faith, that's kind of what we're doing. We're just we're hoping it happens. Prayed for someone to be healed the other day. Really. You know, in faith. He called on the elders of the church to come and anoint him with oil and pray the prayer. So we did. And I prayed, Lord, touch him, heal him, raise him up. And I go out of there thinking, I sure hope God heals him. Because I also know it may not be his will to heal him. You know, I, I pray with all the faith I have and I help my own belief. But, you know, it may not be God's will to heal him at this time. For whatever reason, because God is just, he knows what he's doing. But I sure hope he does. That faith has a lot of hope in it. That, yes, and that person was very hopeful that God is going to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, he's served the Lord a long time. You know, he's a good believer. So, you know, and you go, oh, if anybody gets healed, I hope it's him. <laughs> you know? But that's not what it is in our relationship with Christ. It's not a hoping that he's doing it. It is trusting in what he did. That it is done. It is sealed. It is final. When he said it is finished, it was finished. And his resurrection proved that it was finished. Yeah. When he came back to execute his own will. Great when you can be the, ex the executor of your own will. <laughs> and Jesus is that. You know, he'd come back and make sure it all happens the way he said it was going to happen. Now this verse in here, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I learned that so many years ago. Romans 3.23 For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. What a downer verse. You need to read the verse before and after it. I mean, this stopping in the middle of sentences drives me crazy. Um, but especially the verse afterwards. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, it's like reading John 3.16 and stopping there. Wrong. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed him should not perish but have everlasting life. For he came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Don't stop with that one verse. That next verse is just as key to it. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to get us all saved. <laughs> you know, it's a lot better than it could be, though, Bill. Yeah. Because if it said, for some have sinned, <laughs> Short of the glory of God, you'd be constantly wondering which side of the line you're on. <laughs> That's why he cleared it up. <laughs> you know what side we know what side of that line we're on. <laughs> For all have sinned. It is a good verse, but there's so much around it. And then uh, there's three things he talks about here. We'll end with this tonight. The three the three areas that he's dealing with are first of all being justified. Justification comes out of an image of a, a court of law. Redemption, which is the image of the slave market of that day. And propitiation is the image of the world of religion appeasing God through sacrifice. These three areas. Say it again, please. Okay, justification is right. the image of a court of law. Right. Redemption is the image of the slave market. Mm. And propitiation is the image of the world of religion appeasing God through sacrifice. Mommy, uh, in detail, what a little more what those mean. Justified freely by His grace. We are justified freely. This word free that is used there means cost absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Zero. 
<laughs> Let me tell you, this was a this was a hard thing that I never figured out about 15 years ago. Because I always somehow strings got attached to this free gift. I think well-meaning people did it accidentally. <laughs> Not really thinking it through. In church I would hear, you know, uh, you know you've been saved by grace, gift of God, uh, yourself and saying it's your boast, it's a free gift, it's all yours. Not your duty to do this, this, and this in the yeah, church. Right. I go, well, hold it. It's not free then. There's, connect, there's, there's strings attached to this you didn't tell me about. <laughs> you know? Now, I understand they were trying to motivate people to get involved in the church and, you know, those kinds of things. And, uh, I've probably done it myself <laughs> to get people to do things. <laughs> you know? But salvation is absolutely free. Our justification is completely free. Free. There's nothing attached to it. There's no, that is hard to understand. Because I still want to say, I need to do something to make up for what I did wrong. Mm -hmm. No. There's nothing I can do. It's free. It's completely free. The grace of God is all I need. Nothing more. Through Christ. And I even, probably to this day, struggle with that. So, got to do something. I got to do something. No. I can't do anything. That's what he has spent this whole time talking about. There's not a single thing you can do. I did it all. 100%. And justification, he justifies us, the unmerited favor given to us without regard for what we deserve. It is giving, motivated purely by the giver. And motivated by nothing in the one who receives. Nothing I did deserves it. Not one little thing. It's all about him just giving it. Really. That's a huge concept. <laughs> that God would love us so much that he would come and give us everything we need. And ask nothing in return. To accomplish that. Again, he goes on then to talk about redemption. The idea of that is buying back something that involves cost. Um, as it was at that time here, they would have been thinking the slave market. Somebody's being sold as a slave. You go down there and buy that person back with money. Something that costs you to do that. That is what God did for us. Redemption is he came down and bought us with his own life. Again, a concept that is so hard to really truly grasp that God did that for us. He bought us with himself. Gave his life so that we would be redeemed. Really justified. Redeemed. And then of course the propitiation. He became, his blood became the sacrifice that covered us. It didn't cover us, it removed our sin. Complete atonement. 100%. Um, everything we've ever done, past, present, future, is gone. It's wiped out by his blood. Amazing concept. Um, again, it, it has to be just a concept for us because it's hard for us to grasp. To get a true grasp that it's all done. The Old Testament law provided an animal sacrifice. It covered the sin. But all your sins of the past were still there. You knew you did them. They were there. They were haunting you. They, the guilt was there. All that. I'm okay with God because he said I was by offering that animal. But now those sins are not even there anymore. The past sins have been wiped out. Removed. Gone. And that is, I've got nothing. Every time I come back to God, I did it again. He goes, did what again? <laughs> I don't remember anything. Those are gone. Those are under the blood. They're, they've been cleaned. Right now. Don't talk about your past. Talk about now. What are you doing right now? Oh, well, right now, I'm having a problem. Well, I kind of noticed. You know? But that's, you know, understanding that that propitiation, that sin is completely removed in the past, what we're doing now, and in the future, as long as we stay close to him, whatever we do wrong in the future will be wiped out. It's just gone. 
That's that free gift that is contained in all this. Um, now that word propitiation is also used in the Septuagint as the mercy seat. And uh, that's how the, the, they translated it in the Greek version of the Old Testament, is mercy seat. Which really makes a lot of sense when you stop to think about it. The mercy seat was on the covering of the ark. On the top of the ark, you had the cherubim that went over the, the two wings, came over the top, touching each other, and underneath there was what was called the mercy seat. And then they had the Day of Atonement once a year. That's where they would come in and apply blood to the mercy seat on top. Inside that box is the law. The mercy seat covered it. The law is no longer has any power whatsoever. It's now locked away in a box, so to speak. And the mercy seat is on top. And that is what this propitiation, that word, mercy seat, is who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. He's between us and the law. The law no longer has any power to us whatsoever. Outside of it, it still tells us what sin is. <laughs> if we want to know. Was there a cultural equivalent for the Jews of the mercy seat beforehand? Like, why, why did it have any significance? No, that was what was introduced to them from the law by Moses. When he brought that down, that was all a new development for them. Because up until then, it simply acted, they acted by faith through Abraham. They did what Abraham did, which was he believed God and was counted for him righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's why it all predates law. The whole salvation story predates the law. The law was simply another piece of the puzzle to show us what sin was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The ark, that was the mercy seat? The cover of the ark. So there was some blood on the lid. Yeah. The lid of it had the two cherubim with the wings that almost touched above it, and underneath those wings is what was the mercy seat. And that is where the blood was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. Sprinkled it on there? Yeah, they'd come in and sprinkle the blood on there. And just left it there? Left it. They never touched it? No, nope. they could not touch the ark. In fact, when it was moved, the tent was folded down around it, the pole stuck out, they lifted it and carried it, and when they set it back up, the tent unfolded around it again, so it was never even seen, supposed to be seen. Of course, we know that the time David was around, or during the time of the judges, it was being used as a good luck ark to go out in the wars, and went out in front of the army, and got stolen by the Philistines, and, you know, <laughs> you know they totally misused it. But you remember then when David was moving it up to the city and they were moving it the wrong way, and the guy reached out and touched, put his hand on it, he dropped dead. Because <laughs> it was never to be touched by the Jews. And it wasn't even supposed to be moved on a cart. It was to be carried by those poles on the shoulders of the Levites. They were the ones who were allowed to move it, nobody else. Because it was splattered with blood for hundreds of years. Well, probably. We don't know how faithfully the Jews did anything. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, we know they never did celebrate the year of Jubilee. They yeah, always found a way around it. And, uh, Is that right? Yeah, even to this day, there's a once a year they uh, they will every everything in the land of Israel is sold once a year and they bought back the next day so that they can skip the year of Jubilee to get around it. Yeah. <laughs> They're amazing. They're amazing with the loopholes. <laughs> you want to know why Jesus had to come and do it himself? <laughs> because 